Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak on the topic of from distress to devotion. And I'll speak this in three parts. And after each part, I'll pause briefly. And if you have any reflections or questions, you can ask. And at the end also we'll have. So the three points I'll be speaking is distress is life's one undeniable truth. Second point will be, our purpose determines the magnitude of our distress. And third will be, devotion minimizes life's distress. So the first point is that distress is life's one undeniable truth, reality. <clears throat> there are people can have many different beliefs. Some people believe in God, some people don't believe in God, some people believe they themselves are God. You can have many different ideas, some people believe in soul, some people don't believe in soul. Uh, we, can, we can believe and disbelieve many things in life. But there is one thing we can't disbelieve and that is distress. Everybody experiences distress in life. and. Even if people are very famous and successful, I have traveled across the world and I talk with many people who have been very successful and if you just scrape a little bit below, little bit below the surface, you find that they are all working through their own tragedies. Life is tough for everyone and to some extent in the modern times, we have learned various means of covering up the reality of distress. So through entertainment, we see so many people enjoying life in such big ways, we start thinking maybe that is the way real life is. And then we can't reconcile the way we are having life ourselves. So we, few things make us as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy. <laughs> so, few things make us as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy. Now, if we have a disease and everyone else is healthy, why do I have a disease? It's not that we want everyone to be unhappy, but it's just that we live in a democracy. So, if distress is democratic, then we feel it's okay. Yeah, there's an epidemic, everybody is sick over here. Why me alone? But actually, everybody is facing distress sooner or later. And there have been existentialist philosophers in the 20th century who came up with very gloomy reflections on distress. There was a philosopher Albert Camus. he said that life is distress. So therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> so, now the distress is universal and this is what the Bhagavad Gita also tells us. Now at one level this can seem pessimistic but it's not necessarily pessimistic. It's actually realistic and we may go to many motivational talks and they'll tell you do this and you become happy and you do this and we may feel good temporarily but at the back of our mind, a wiser part of us knows that this is just painting a rotten building. It's just putting a nice coating. And if you put nice fresh coating, the building can look like new. But it is a rotten building. And that's why if we come to Shastra, we come to the Bhagavad Gita and we hear the world is a place of distress. It's actually not pessimistic, it's actually gives a lot of relief. Why relief? That means I'm not abnormal. Why are there so many problems in my life? No, you're not abnormal. Everybody has problems. It's just that different people may have problems in different <coughs> ways. But distress is life's one undeniable reality. And recognizing this does not mean 
that we resign ourselves to a distressful life. The point when the Bhagavad Gita says that this world is Dukkha Laya, the Gita is not telling Arjun that, okay, this world is Dukkha Laya, so stay Dukhi now. This world is full of distress, so stay distressful. No, not that, that's not the point. The Bhagavad Gita has spoken to Arjun at the start of the Gita, he was in great distress. Tantatha Kripaya Vishtam Ashru Purna Kulekshanam his, his eyes were brimming with tears. Normally, no matter how distressed we are, we don't cry in public. And especially somebody who is like a warrior kind of man like Arjun, for him to cry in public means he must be in great distress. So at the beginning of the Gita, he's in distress. At the, at the end of Gita, he's calmed down. Nashto mohasmati labdha tvat prasadan maya chuta sthito smigata sandeha karishye vachanam tava so he, so he says, well, my doubt is gone, my delusion is dispelled, I have calmed down. So his distress has to a significant extent gone. So when we say distress is life's undeniable reality, that doesn't mean that we are, we are all meant to be always distressed. It's like recognizing that the world is like a hospital. So if in a hospital all the patients are in denial, then neither can they take the treatment nor can the doctor give the treatment. So, what we do when we begin that this is one life's undeniable reality, distress. We acknowledge the world is like a hospital and let me see how I can move out of it. What can I do to deal with it? How can I deal with the distress? How can I overcome the distress? What can I do about it? As long as we deny distress, we can't deal with it at all. That was the first point I was going to make. The distress is you, is one life's one undeniable reality. So, any questions or comments at this point? Yeah, Prabhuji, I have one. Yeah. You mentioned that if you see other people healthy, that's the word you said. We feel a little distressed, unhealthy. A few things, unhappy, I said. I'm not healthy, unhealthy, unhappy. Few things make us as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy. We go to a nursing home where the people are just lying in lot of distress. So thinking that you feel now happy, so you are better with that. So it's wise words are what you say. That's number one point. Number two, what causes the distress in your life? You haven't mentioned that. What is the cause of it? Is it the challenge in your life about this thing that you want to achieve something and you yeah. fail? That's the next point. I want to talk about purpose. Yeah. So that's so the next point, yeah. There has to be some challenge in life to achieve something in your life. That's true. And it is possible you can fail and then you get into space. But it doesn't stop your challenge. It's a good point, yes. Thank you. So yes, sometimes when we are in a lot of distress, if we meet somebody who is in greater distress than us, then we start feeling my situation is not so bad. Sometimes, when we are in too much distress, you know, we, can th we may feel that my life is helpless, I am completely trapped, I can't do anything. Have any of you felt like that? I am in such a trap right now, I can't do anything about it. Any of you felt like that any time? Anyone? Yes, some of you. If you have felt like that, you can jolt yourself by one counterintuitive question. Counterintuitive question. That okay, things are bad now, and I feel I am powerless. But no matter how bad things are, can I make them worse? You say, who wants to make them worse? They are already bad. Yeah, that's not the point whether we should make them worse. Of course, we should not. But can we make them worse? Yes, no matter how bad things are, we can always make them worse. Though know, we might slip and fall and get a fracture and maybe bedridden for the next one month. And we will be frustrated. But then, and we feel I'm helpless at the bed, I can't do anything. But I can always take a hammer and crack my other knee. <laughs> Isn't it? So, the point I'm making over here is that no matter how bad things are, 
we can always make them worse. And that means we are not as powerless as we think. If we can make things worse, then we can make them better also. So that feeling of powerlessness can prevent us from doing something which we could do to ch change the situation for the better. So we do need some challenge and power purpose in our life. That's my second point. So the first point was that distress is universal. Now, if we look at our own lives, it is, I'm talking on the second point, our purpose decreases, our purpose determines the magnitude of our distress. See, we are not afraid of distress itself. We are afraid of, or we don't, we dislike especially purposeless distress. Say, if you are walking along a road somewhere and suddenly a thorn pricks us in the foot, we will be annoyed, we will be irritated, we will be infuriated also. But if we go to a hospital and we take an injection, the injection, the dose is also going to prick us. But there, it's a pain, but it's not that big a pain. Why? Because we know it has a purpose. Mm -hmm. This is going to treat me, this is going to heal me. So it's not just the experience that determines our pain or how much we suffer because of that. It determines what is our purpose. Our purpose determines the magnitude of the distress. So when I see something as purposeful, then we are better ready to tolerate it. Say if somebody just tells us, okay, I got this 20, 30 kg suitcase, you carry it. <sighs> okay, I have to carry it, what to do? I say that. But if we are going to a gym to train our body and there we go and lift, maybe we lift more than 30 kg weight. And we feel proud, I lifted so much weight. I said, because there we see it's purposeful. So now, most of us probably think that the purpose of life is pleasure. Yeah, we, say, yeah, we all want to be happy. However, pleasure is too cheap and too fragile to sustain us through life's troubles. If we make pleasure as the purpose of our life, it is too cheap and too fragile. What do I mean? These two words are important. Too cheap. Cheap means what? Say most of us probably have some children in our close or extended family. And sometimes when you have to have fun with children, we might tickle the ch child. Isn't it? Now when you tickle someone, especially the child, you tickle them and they start laughing. <laughs> now they start laughing like a child. Now. Is that happiness? What do you think? Is that happiness? Well, maybe some kind of happiness. But if that itself, if that's where happiness and happiness is our life's purpose, then we all could get a, our own perpetual tickling machines. <laughs> and we can tickle ourselves for the rest of our lives. Or some people like to watch comedies shows. Now in today's internet connected world, we could, if say, if we had enough financial security, we had no obligations, we could sit and watch comedy from morning to say, night. Now we might do it for maybe a day or two. After that, what would happen? I want something to do in their life. If somebody said, for the rest of your life, you just watch comedy. I want to do something, isn't it? We want to bite our, bite, our, bite our teeth in something, do something challenging. So pleasure, although we all want pleasure, pleasure is too cheap a purpose for our life. Again, what we want is some meaningful pleasure. If you consider the happiest moments in our life, you look back. It's not just when you went to do something for enjoyment and got some enjoyment. The most deeply happy moments are when we did something worthwhile. Something was difficult, something was challenging. 
but when we went we took the trouble did that and then we feel some fulfillment so happiness is best experienced as a by product not a product a product means i do something to get happiness by product means that i am doing something meaningful and happiness comes as a result as a it's not even the main result but as a by product so happiness is best experienced as a by product not as a product and what is the it is a by product of a meaningful life suppose somebody decides to become a doctor and then study very hard it's a lot of competition somehow they su survive they succeed and then they are able to treat someone and heal someone by that then they feel some satisfaction if you have family and then you work very hard and you take care of your family and a child grows up and becomes a good human being a good person then you feel fulfillment so happiness is best experienced if we take responsibility to do something meaningful in our lives and <clears throat> this is where wisdom is differentiated from knowledge the knowledge you could say knowledge means to know that tomato is a fruit wisdom means to know that tomato should not be put in the fruit salad <laughs> so what is the difference that technically something might fall in this category but it is not belong practically over here the fruit salad you cannot put that so similarly for us when we are going through life at that time we all have certain purposes but if pleasure is the purpose of our life the pleasure means what if somebody thinks that okay whatever i am doing i should be able to enjoy it just about uh, 10 days ago i was in stanford i gave a talk over there and after that was an american lady came and she was telling me that her daughter she is in stanford obviously to be in stanford she is brilliant but she says she has changed her major for 12 years now so she is around 29 and she is still in the first year of her major i said why she says that she feels she doesn't feel happy studying her subjects so she, i want to find out what what study will give me happiness so now okay yeah studying yeah, we don't want to study a subject which we utterly dislike but if you just makes make pleasure the purpose of studying you can't sustain you can't sustain at all because what will happen is that even if we like something there are times when we will not like it the nature of the world and the nature of the mind are such that even if there is something which we really like to do but there will be times when we will just not like it one of my main services is writing i have written about 25 books some of them will be available outside after the talk so i get very a lot of absorption when i write but still there are times when writing can be so exhausting frustrating because nothing seems to be coming or at least whatever is coming is not good enough so we get into what is called a writer's block so there is a writer who said that writing is very easy all that you have to do is just sit in front of a computer and glare at the screen till drops of blood form on your forehead <laughs> oh, it's even if you like to write there will be time when you will not like it so if we start living only for pleasure then what happens when the pleasure stops you think why continue this so pleasure is to as a first it's too cheap a purpose and secondly pleasure is too fragile a purpose if i think the purpose of education is pleasure then if i have to study a subject which i don't like will i give it up pleasure as a purpose will not sustain us it's too fragile because sometimes life will put us in distressful situations 
nowadays relationships are breaking down quite a bit in the past we had joint families then there were nuclear families and now we also have nuclear fission and electrons and protons are orbiting around alone in the concrete jungles now this is of course a complex and sad uh, occurrence now there could be many reasons for it but one reason is that in the past people understood that relationships are obligations is this my responsibility a formal relationship let me go through it but now relationship is seen not as an obligation but as an option so yeah okay i don't enjoy this why should i continue it when that is the attitude in every relationship there will be difficulties one of my friends is a marriage psychologist so he told me there are only two kinds of couples i have met this one is couples who quarrel among each other and the other is those whom i don't know very well those who i don't know very well so that means there are differences among everyone so just two people are going to live together it's never going to be a uh, always a smooth flow so if pleasure is the purpose of the relationship after some time the pleasure stops with me why am i here so pleasure is too fragile a purpose to sustain us through life's troubles and that's why we need a higher purpose in fact when pleasure becomes our purpose then distress seems to be the entirely opposite of that and then you think why why should i have this distress why should i tolerate this and the worst situation comes when we we think pleasure is the purpose and when we get distress and then we become we feel we are victimized i am a victim this person did like this to me that thing happened over there this person did like that now many people go through their lives feeling victimized now it's true that sometimes bad things do happen and it's 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 it terrible when it happens but in one sense everyone is a victim sometime or other so life victimizes us all and if distress if pleasure is our driving purpose in life then what happens when distress comes we feel victimized and once we feel victimized then we become resentful resentful and then revengeful why why is this suffering coming in my life why is this person so happy and when we become resentful and revengeful then it's a very dangerous track to go on we can become aggressive we can become violent we can become hateful and many of i was just came from i came from australia so about 15 about 15 20 days ago so there the whole that continent australia new zealand was shaken because there was this brutal shooting in christ church there in a place of worship uh, a race maddened person just went and shot indiscriminately now he published his manifesto and his whole manifesto why he did it all he wondered people want publicity see what happens is sometimes people feel that my existence doesn't count so i wanted to count in some way or the other now to become famous by doing something good is very difficult but to become famous by doing something bad is relatively easy so we can become hateful and we can become terribly violent so all of new zealand was shaken because of that and basically we may think such a horrible person but if we look at our own thought sometimes we also get horrible thoughts about other people we all can't see each other's thoughts and that's a great blessing <laughs> if we could start and see each other's thoughts not a single relationship could be sustained how you think like this about me you have that kind of desires you this is your opinion about me would be impossible so nature has given us some nature has given us some natural buffer between our thoughts and our actions so the point i am making is this is the second point that pleasure is too fragile what is the purpose that purpose will determine the magnitude of our distress so if the purpose itself is pleasure then it will be very fragile and why am i doing this there is no pleasure just let me give it up and let me hit out at all the people who are having pleasure cuz if i am suffering what right do they have to be happy it can become a very very dark mindset 
so uh, by our by our purpose if we have made pleasure the purpose of our life when distresses come we will increase the magnitude of our distress we will make ourselves more miserable than we need to be but if we have some higher purpose for our life then we will see that okay the pleasure is that per that pleasure is not there that pain distress is there but it's a part of my life let me do something meaningful let me do something worthwhile and you no know, when we say purpose as so i was talking with that mother and her daughter so i told him that you know it's not that you have to you will be sitting and one day you will discover a purpose the purpose comes not by discovery but by responsibility purpose comes not by sunday you are one day you are sitting and some light goes off in your head yeah this is the purpose of my life this is what i meant to do no purpose comes not by some mystical discovery but by conscious responsibility conscious responsibility means okay this is the situation i am in this is what i know about myself these are my abilities these are my needs these are my limitations in this situation how can i take responsibility how can i act in a responsible way so to the extent we take responsibility to that extent it gives us a purpose in our life otherwise is thinking one day i'll find my purpose and what is my idea of my purpose something which makes me feel good but no matter what makes us feel good today tomorrow it will not make us feel good you know if we ask our mind what is the purpose of my life the mind will give us one answer whatever you are doing right now that is not the purpose of your life <laughs> that is not the purpose even if we go to paradise the mind will say yes but you'll find something to complain about so this was the second point i made that it is purpose that determines the magnitude of our pleasure or pain and if pleasure is the purpose of our life then we can increase our distress because pleasure is too cheap and too fragile to sustain us through life struggles any comments or questions about this so let me go to the last point now the last point was the uh, first i talk about that distress is unavoidable and second is purpose determines the magnitude of the distress third point is a devotional purpose can decrease our distress and what do we mean by devotional purpose <clears throat> see most people think of devotion or religion or worship as a means to some purpose say i am in some trouble and i come to god and i pray to god oh god please help me solve this problem so what is happening over there in we here when we come to god we have some other purpose and to fulfill that purpose we want we want to, we want god to help us in that once a person got purchase a lottery ticket and it was worth a million dollars the first prize so he came to a temple and he said to god oh god if i win this ticket i'll give you 50% mm, and then after that it was after one week that result was going to come every day he was praying and waiting and then when the results were announced he saw that his name was there as a winner he was delighted yahoo and suddenly he stopped he noticed that he had won the second prize it was half a million dollars so he thought about it and then he came to the temple and he said oh god you are so clever you took your share before only <laughs> so what happens over here in such situations we are treating god as a means to some purpose it's good that at least we are coming to god it's good that at least we are worshiping and connecting with some higher reality however the defining difference between religion and spirituality 
Many people like to say, I am SBNR. SBNR means they say that I am spiritual but not religious. So they say religion is narrow minded, it is, it is dogmatic, uh, whereas spirituality is open minded, it is experiential. Yes, that's good. We, want to be, we don't want to be narrow minded or, or dogmatic. But at the same time, in the main difference between religion and spirituality is in our purpose. When we, are, when we are just pious or religious, we see God as a means to some end in the world. Whereas when we are spiritual, we understand that God is the ultimate end. Bahunam janmana mante kyanavan maam prapadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha. And the Bhagavad Gita says, after many lifetimes of spiritual evolution, we understand that Vasudeva Sarvamiti, that Vasudeva Krishna is everything. He is the be all and end all of life. Whatever, whatever joy we might get in obtaining anything, connecting with anyone, achieving anything, all that joy and more we will get if we become connected with Krishna and devotion. Everything attractive everywhere manifests a spark of Krishna's splendor. Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam shri madur jitame vava tatta deva vagachatvam mamate jom shasambhava. In 1041 in the Gita, Krishna says that everything attractive manifests a spark of his splendor. The spark of his splendor. So what does it mean? That whatever it is attractive, and different people are attracted to different things. And you know, when A is attracted to something and B is not attracted, say, what is this? What, what do you find so attractive in this? Yoga is yoga has come from India, but it is much more popular in the West than it is in India. Now I have gone to yoga studios and I have given talks on yoga wisdom. So I came to know recently there is another new form of yoga which has no scriptural mention, it is called Doga. <laughs> what is Doga? Doga is yoga with your dog. <laughs> and actually you said there are yoga teachers, there are Doga teachers. Because some people are so much in love with their dogs. Say I want whatever I do in my life, I want to do it with my best friend. So if I want to do yoga, I also want to do yoga with my dog. So even the dog has to learn yoga. And then the yoga teacher comes and people do yoga with their dogs. So now we may find what is what is there so attractive about a dog? Somebody who is not a who doesn't have has never had dog as a pet or who is not who is not experienced that is what is there so attractive in this? Now, now, now somebody else who might be mad with their dogs, they might say that somebody is mad after some sports stars. Some cricket stars, some basketballs. What do you find so attractive in this person? So sometimes we may not be able to comprehend why people are mad after this person or that person or this thing or that thing. It is because they are experiencing a spark of Krishna over there. But it's only a spark. If we are in dark, even a spark will give some light. But the spark cannot give much light. It cannot give light which will illumine the whole room. That's why whatever we get attracted to, we may get some pleasure, some connection, some joy in that. But it won't last for long. If you understand that, okay, this is attracting me so much, but what is attractive about this? It is Krishna. Now what do we mean by Krishna? Krishna is not just some, some, some image we see in the temple. Krishna, if you understand this, is the, is the source and reservoir of everything attractive. That is the meaning of God. God is the best in, in our conception of everything and even beyond our conception of everything. So in bhakti, when we understand that God is my purpose, that means what, what does mean that means that whatever I do, I do it ultimately for the purpose of connecting more with Krishna, of learning to love Krishna more, of becoming more absorbed in Krishna. So we do have some practical purposes, say when we are working at our job, we are taking care of our families, we are doing all, we have some practical purposes. But the practical purpose is not our ultimate purpose. Just like a student who is studying, say the ch child is learning to write. Now at one level, the ch child is learning to write, 
the child's purpose may be okay i want to pass this exam i want to do this assignment otherwise my teacher my parents will will, will be unhappy with me that's one purpose but there is a much bigger purpose a child has the child learns writing that is going to be a lifelong as asset so every activity can have multiple levels of purposes if a child thinks only completing the assignment is my purpose then the child may never learn writing so similarly for us whatever we do in our lives there there is some immediate purpose for us but there is a bigger purpose the bigger purpose is ultimately we want to connect with krishna what we are is krishna's gift to us and what we become is our gift to krishna what we are is krishna's gift to us we all have certain ability certain talent certain capacity certain interests certain passions so what we are right now is krishna's gift to us and what we become with what we have what we become is our gift to krishna so we want to use our talents not just to have big achievements so that the world can know how big i am some people say i have many hidden talents the problem is they are hidden even from me <laughs> so some people they they are interested in the talents not just so that they can do something meaningful they are they are interested in the talents so that they can get the world to praise them the world can know how great i am that's one purpose but that's a very fickle purpose if we understand our talents our abilities are gifts from god and we can use them in a mode of devotion and service yes i want to make a contribution in this world in the best way that i can but i also want to make a connection with krishna you have given me these gifts let me use them in your service if we are in relationship in family our children our spouses our parents we see that relationship not just you know i do this for this person this person will do this for me we don't have this a transactional attitude towards the relationship a transactional attitude means that basically both partners or both people in the relationship are simply maneuvering in a power game to gain more control it's like a transactional interaction is where you go to a shop and you want to buy something now the customer wants to pay as less as possible and get as much as he want and the seller wants to sell as less and get as much money as they want as they can so both of them are maneuvering for control so that kind of relationship cannot be very steady or fulfilling now once there's a marriage counselor he was counseling people so he said all the men over here all those men who are controlled by their wives come on this side and all the men who are in control of their wives come on this side so all the men went on one side only one man went on the other side so he asked him you are, are you in control of your wife actually my wife told me to come here <laughs> 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 so basically you know sometimes people are just uh, maneuvering for control in a power game and if that is the case then there cannot be much fulfillment in that relationship but yes we all have our weaknesses but if we see that my relationship with this person is not only my relationship with this person ultimately by relating with this the person and by doing my responsibility in this relationship i am connecting with krishna it is ultimately by krishna's arrangement that i am in this situation and by doing my my role in a responsible way i'll grow toward krishna and the, to the extent we take this responsibility in our lives to that extent we'll find that the distress will get minimized how does that happen i'll conclude with this point and then we can have questions that we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain we may have to live with pain that means pain is a part of my life but to live in pain means pain completely consumes my life now what is the difference between the two and how can we move from so where should we live should we live with pain or in pain better without pain <laughs> is it <laughs> sorry through pain through pain 
through pain okay yeah we have to live through it that's true good point mm. so now the best would be if there were no pain but if at all pain were there it is better that we live with pain rather than in pain so now what will determine this so if we think that my current situation is my permanent situation if if in present i have some pain and if you are too obsessed with only the present then we'll feel this pain is going to be always there in my life and how can i live what is the point of my life if i have to live in pain like this but if we see that the present is there but it's not permanent now what you said live through pain see what happens is sometimes when we are going through a dark phase in our life we start thinking that this is like a dungeon in which i am going to be permanently trapped but actually it's not a dungeon it's a tunnel it's a tunnel if we keep walking no matter how dark it seems the darkness will end we can look back at our own lives in the past we have all gone through dark phases at that time we might seem this might have seemed overwhelming but now they're over so what seemed overwhelming in the past is over now so what seems overwhelming now will also be over in the future so rather than getting overwhelmed what we see our spirituality helps us understand that we are souls we are eternal we are much bigger than our present situations and therefore this present situation is not our permanent situation seeing that perspective i may be in pain right now but i don't have to obsess over it another point is if we have a satisfying object of thought then our pain can become minimized a great need for all of us is a satisfying object of thought in fact entertainment people are so obsessed with it because they they have nothing to satisfy to think about therefore okay let me just turn watch some movie let me see this see the sports i want something satisfying to think about so uh, the most satisfying object of thought is krishna so when we start thinking about krishna our problems may not go away but many times if we keep thinking about the problem the problem starts becoming more and more and more now if you see a graph of problem solving capacity with time if i have a problem and i don't think about the problem only that is a problem i have to think about it so that i can solve it so when i think about it you can say the graph moves straight up it my capacity to solve the problem as i think more and more okay i have got this issue i'll do this i'll do this i'll do this i get some clarity but if you keep thinking about it after some time it just comes to a flat you keep thinking keep thinking there's no solution that comes up and after some time the graph starts going down the more we think the more confused we become the more overwhelmed we become the more disheartened we become some people say i was confused earlier now i'm not so sure <laughs> i was confused earlier now i'm not so sure the same thing so overthinking is often a big problem so when we are practicing krishna bhakti what are we doing when we make krishna the purpose of our life and okay i have nothing to i have this problem i i thought as much as i can about dealing with it but no solution is coming so let me turn my thoughts towards krishna and thinking about krishna will give us relief it will give us strength even if the problem is not solved still we will get relief because the the mind is being obsessed with the problem the mind being tormented by the problem will not happen it's like say outside there is a lot of heat and we come to air condition room the heat outside has not gone away but we feel relief so similarly we may have problems in our life but when we become conscious of krishna then we feel relief unfortunately what we do is that we come to the door of a air conditioned room we open the door and we wait for the air conditioning to heat up the world outside to cool the world outside that is not going to happen that means we come to krishna but when we come to krishna we are still thinking about our problems 
instead of becoming Krishna conscious, we remain problem conscious. Instead of reminding ourselves how big Krishna is. If we remember how big Krishna is, the problem will become small. But we come in front of Krishna and we keep remembering how big the problem is. So don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. So when we become conscious of Krishna, then we will find that even amidst distress we will get relief. If we are just thinking about the problem, we will be living in pain. But if we think about Krishna, the problem will still be there. We will be living with pain, not in pain. And that's why we need to make a habit of becoming conscious of Krishna. The more regularly we become conscious, chant Hare Krishna, come in satsang, do some puja, study the Shastra, we make a habit of being conscious of Krishna, then when distress comes, we can direct our consciousness toward him. And then we can experience relief amidst distress also. And gradually by Krishna's guidance, we will get the intelligence to move out of the problem, to solve the problem, to outgrow the problem. So that's by making Krishna the purpose of our life. We will be able to minimize the distress. Instead of living with pain, we will live in pain. When Prabhupada was asked, what is Krishna consciousness? He gave different answers. One answer he gave was that, when we come in front of the deities, if we feel Krishna is asking me, what are you doing for me? That, you, that we are the servants of Krishna, so we are meant to do something for Krishna. What are you doing for me? If you feel like that, then we are Krishna conscious. But most of the most times, we come to the temple and we say, Krishna, we ask Krishna, what are you doing for me? <laughs> I have this problem, this problem, this problem. What are you doing for me? So if we come with that attitude, we will never reap the full enriching power of Krishna consciousness. When we make Krishna our purpose, we will find that we will discover that we are tougher than what we thought. That whatever faces us is never as big as what graces us. Whatever faces us is never as big as what graces us. Krishna graces us from within. The world has a huge power to hurt. But greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. Greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. So instead of turning toward the world, we turn toward Krishna. And thereby, we gain relief even amidst our distress. I'll summarize what I spoke today. So I spoke on the topic of how we can experience distress how devo from de distress to devotion. How we can move. So I talked about it in three parts. The first part I spoke was that distress is life's undeniable reality. Uh, everybody has distress. Distress is democratic. And we can argue about the non-existence of God, soul or whatever. We can't argue about the non-existence of distress. And few things make us as unhappy as our belief that everyone else is happy. So when we say life is distressful, that doesn't mean that we are meant to be live a life full of distress. It just means that the world is like a hospital. So we begin with a realistic starting point. The second point I talk about is that our purpose determines the magnitude of our distress. If somebody is, somebody gets uh, injection, it's pain. If somebody gets a thorn, that's also pain. But one is purposeful, the other is purposeless. And our irritation is significantly lesser when it's purposeful. So most of us think pleasure is the purpose of life. But pleasure is too cheap and too fragile. And we could always get a perpetual tickling machine or just sit and watch comedies for the rest of our life. But we'll be bored. It's too cheap and too fragile. Because when, if we are to have a meaningful life, sometimes we will have to face distress. So if we think I'm studying only for pleasure, we might ending up might end up spending 12 years just going from one major to another. If we think that relationship is only for pleasure, then we might just keep jumping from one relationship to another to another. But when we take up, a, when we have a purpose, then we see, okay, this pleasure, pain may come, but it's a part of life. I'm doing something purposeful. And purpose comes not through some mystical discovery, but by conscious responsibility. Oh, then I talked about how devotion 
devotional purpose can minimize our distress. Then I spoke that devotion is not just doing some ritual of worship. Devotion means making God the purpose of our life. Not that we use God to achieve some other purpose. Not like that lottery ticket where he said that, oh, you already took your share. We understand that everything that is attractive in the world, its attractiveness comes from Krishna. So whatever joy I get in connecting with that, all that joy and more I'll get in connecting with Krishna. So to make Krishna the purpose of our life means to see that whatever we are doing, we are doing it for the purpose of connecting with Krishna. So what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. And when we do our <coughs> When we do our uh, when we do our work, it's like a child can study for just getting the um, can learn writing to get the assignment done, or can can learn writing to be able to go to, to write well. So we all have a particular purposes, but we need a bigger purpose also. So in our relationships, in our jobs, we understand ultimately I am doing this in a mood of contribution to connect with Krishna. He has given me these abilities. He has put me in this situation. Let me serve him. And when we have that ultimate purpose, even if there is some some distress at the immediate level, that bigger purpose will keep us moving. And we may have to live with pain, but we won't live in pain. The bigger picture expands our consciousness. If you are too present obsessed, then the present is all that will consume us. We think I am in a tunnel, I am in a dungeon and I am trapped. But we understand it's a tunnel, if I keep moving on, I will come out. And when we, when we don't tell God how big our problems are, but tell our problems how big God is. Come to God not to ask what are you doing for me, but ask what am I doing for God. When we make it a habit to fix our consciousness on Krishna, then amidst problems, we talk about when we think too much, the problems become worse by overthinking. So we need a satisfying object of thought. When Krishna becomes our satisfying object of thought, then we will be able to rise beyond distress. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? We have a few minutes. Yes, please. I was remembering one thing about uh, your second point, purpose. Uh, yeah. Like uh, Victor Frankl. Yeah. He says, having a meaning in life, a bigger goal, that helps to go through the situation. Correct, yes, that's true. So he didn't talk much about what was the purpose, uh, yeah. but he talks about, yes, purpose is what helps us to move forward in life. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now, for somebody whose purpose is pleasure now, and they are not a practitioner yet, but we want to help them go through that to change the purpose to God for them. How do we help them? For now, okay. they see that okay, good question. Goal, right? Okay, good question. So, if somebody has pleasure as the purpose of their life, how can we help them to make God the purpose? Well, it's not that you have to give up pleasure to make God the purpose. Even in connecting with God, there is pleasure. But it is not that always there will be pleasure. Sometimes we will go to dry, through dry phrases in our devotion also. So, so generally, we humans have this capacity, it's a remarkable capacity to negotiate with reality. That means we can forego of pleasure in the present for a brighter future. That's, that's the whole principle of sacrifice. A student could be playing, but the ch ch children, they, they could be playing, but they say, no, I'll forego of the pleasure of playing so that I can have a brighter future. So this is built into every fabric of life. See, that we need to give up, forego something in the present so that we can get to something in the future, something bigger in the future. So if you understand that point, then we understand the. Then we can, we can start with that point, and nobody will deny that principle. Isn't it? If you want to learn anything, even if somebody wants to enjoy music, yeah, you can enjoy music. But if you want to practice music, it's hard work. Okay, to get this right again and again and again and again to get this right, it takes time. It takes effort. So that principle, if we understand, the only the major difference is that when we apply that principle to spirituality, then the result is eternal. In any other area, the result may be long term. If somebody spends throughout their childhood and youth hours and hours, day after day, say learning some physical skills, say they, they discipline themselves to become cricketers, say. 
they might succeed, but they'll get it for 10, 15, 20 years. If somebody wants to become a musician, somebody wants to become whatever, software engineer also, that also requires sacrifice. So I feel sacrifice is a, un the word sacrifice people may not use, but that principle is universal. And then if you tell them that, okay, yes, pleasure is the purpose, but there are different kinds of pleasure. You could just sit and watch movies right now and get some pleasure, but you could work hard and learn some skill and then get absorption, contribution through that skill and you will get better pleasure. So devotion is also like that. So the same principle, but expanded to the scale of eternity. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Anyone more more question? Last question? Yeah? I don't know how it connects to the topic, but when I go through the distress, what helps me is seeing past distresses, how they help me in going towards Krishna, number one, and then understanding <coughs> that Krishna is helping me through this somehow to get closer to him, and then also uh, trying to use the distress to pray to Krishna, either to remove the distress or at least asking for strength like that. I don't need to place to that in what you were saying. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. See, I didn't go much into how specifically uh, in Krishna consciousness we can see the distress. So, yes, we could say that past distresses help us to grow up spiritually. And it's almost always true that it is tough experiences, either voluntarily chosen or involuntarily imposed that help us to grow <coughs> physical growth happens automatically it's like hey, suppose somebody is going for weight lifting now if they look at the weights yeah, this is such a big weight i can't lift it but if they look at somebody who has a very attractive physique hey i want to have a physique like that so depending on our vision where our vision is our motivation is determined accordingly that's of course a, this is a material example but the point is that if we look at the distress alone this is so terrible but if we understand in general distress is the way to growth in life or in nature also we see things are broken down to be made better the clouds in the sky can look very beautiful but clouds have to break apart so that rains can come then when soil when now the, the, the soil may look very good, but you have to put a plow through it to break the soil. Only then you can use it for irrigation, for cultivation, agriculture. Then when grains come, grains have to be broken so that you make flour, so that it becomes cookable. Then when the food is cooked, you get chapatis, you get parathas, you get so many items. You have to break them so that you can eat them. Sometimes when devotees serve prasad, the plate is arranged so artistically that you feel as if eating this is doing violence to this artistry. <laughs> but how will you get nourishment otherwise? So sometimes, not sometimes, most of the times, the existing order needs to be broken so that a better order can emerge. And that's why in our lives, we may have some order in our life and a distress comes. Why does distress come? The distress means chaos, it's, it's, it's confusion, it's, it's panic, it's fear. But often, nature order has to be broken so that a better order can emerge. So if you understand this principle, this is how in general nature works. And ultimately, controlling nature is Krishna, this is how Krishna works. So then, we can, we may never be, we may never be able to welcome distress. It's almost impossible. But what we can do is, at least we can, not resent distress. So, yeah, this distress is there, but I don't want to resent it. I won't resent it. Let me see how I can move on in my life. So, yes, looking at how Krishna, how the past distress has helped us grow spiritually, how Krishna, being conscious of Krishna has helped us in the past to go through distress, and how through the distress we have learned something better. So, I use the acronym ACE. Ace. Ace is when distress comes, 
look for the good around the bad hmm? look for the good that can help us to counter the bad see and look for the good that may emerge from the bad so ace if you look at it this this is bad but what are the good things in my life there are many good things in my life also look for the good around the bad then okay among the good things that i suppose i lost my uh, suppose say i suddenly lost my job that's a bad thing but look for the good around it look for the good that can help you to counter it okay i am young i am healthy i have some experience i have some credentials i can get another job so look for the good that can help us to counter the bad and an e is look for the good that may emerge from the bad that's like when the cloud is broken that's bad but from that rains which are usable which survive which leads to sustenance of life they come so if we have that attitude that the order of things in life is that order is disrupted so that better order can emerge then we can face distress more positively okay. thank you very much mr prabhupad ki gaur bhakti vrind ki jai gaur prem anand de